Good to see everyone joining in tonight. Those of you joining in on the live streams, if you're catching us at the very beginning, welcome. Today is another professional development seminar that we are hosting through our Poet Artist Development Program. Those of you in the program tonight here joining in on Zoom are, of course, the fortunate ones who have this uh, every month scheduled into the program. Um, and also, as we get started, I wanted to give a special shout out to Heidi Wu, who's in the house right now. Um, Heidi, we will be celebrating the release of your chat book. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Grow Towards the Sun. We'll be celebrating the release of your chat book at the LA Times Festival of Books uh, happening at USC, the University of Southern California. Yeah, big congratulations. It's been a year and a half in the making or so. Um, we also, uh, even though she's not in the house at the moment, um, officially today, the um, production files for Dr. Rosie Ramos's uh, chapbook were also sent to the printer, and it will also be making its debut to the public at the LA Times Festival of Books, alongside the third uh, chapbook that is produced through this program called 66 Miles to Paradise from Pomona, Pomona Valley to the World by our own Gustavo Reyes Ramirez. So uh, yeah, big deal. Three chat books being released all in the same month by our amazing poet artists in this program. So congratulations, everybody. A big, huge round of applause to all of you. I'm, I'm really happy and very proud to have their work uh, among the catalog of the ever-growing catalog of distill arts. So it's a big deal. Yeah. And to, you know, kind of hopefully inspire those of you who are, uh, you know, working towards the publication of your own work, uh, you know, whether that be in the program here with us through distill arts, or if you are an individual that is just, you know, watching the live streams or the recording after the fact, and, you know, really kind of interested or curious about how to get a creative career going. Uh, that is the purpose, of course, of our professional development seminars. And, you know, again, to just introduce us, if you are watching this for the very first time, don't know what Distill Arts is. Distill Arts is a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. The acronym in our name stands for Develop Skills and Transcend Limits Through the Arts. And our programs are primarily focused on uh, supporting emerging artists from historically marginalized communities and individuals of all ages and abilities. We have a variety of programs. It, of course, includes our Conchas y Café bilingual community writing workshops, which are currently actually looking for submissions. If you want to submit to the current zine, the theme is Through the Lens. It's a combination of photography and poetry uh, workshop, uh, at least for this 15-week cycle. Every 15 weeks that we offer it, it does have a different theme, and it produces a uh, different zine each time, A you know, obviously a new issue of Conchas y Café zine. Art Block Zine is also currently accepting submissions for anyone out there. Um, the artistic zine and art blog zine, we call them sister zines, where art blog zine is the one that specifically focuses on showcasing the talents of LA County based artists, whereas artistic zine is specifically for artists who are neurodivergent and who reside within the United States. Um, all of the zines that we currently have, um, Conchas y Café zine, art blog zine, and artistic zine, um, each one of them has a current open call for submissions. Art Blog Zine and Concha y Café Zine, both of them close their submissions in the month of May, one at the beginning of May with Concha y Café Zine, and then Art Blog Zine at the end of May. Uh, Artistic Zine has an, uh, an open call for submissions that goes all the way through to July. And then our current Creative Impact uh, Anthology, LA Transit, has a uh, deadline for submission also at the end of May. Um, and that one is a sub program of the Poet Artist Development Program, which again, you know, it is celebrating the release of a variety of zines and publications produced by 
our uh, emerging poet artists in our programs, um, in this program specifically. The purpose of tonight, though, is, you know, going over publishing contracts and commissions, um, you know, which is sort of the culmination of this particular series. But there's a lot of different things to consider uh, as you start your career as an emerging artist, as, as a working artist, I should say. And for that, I wanted to hear from those of you who have been attending these on a monthly basis. What are the key factors that you are currently considering as you plan your career as a working artist? You know, think about all of the different topics that we've covered up to this point. What have you learned up to now? And what are you currently working on developing as part of your plan? Feel free to raise your hand drop it in the chat <laughs> getting a third job according to angie <laughs> i mean i wouldn't exactly call it a third job just you know an addition to your duties with the still arts as our program coordinator <laughs> uh evan shares that she is working on online presence with a website and social media excellent it's always a good way to start, a good place to start. <laughs> Asking for a raise. Gotcha, Angie. Well, we'll need to talk about that later. <laughs> but yes, working on that online presence is a good, good place to start. We did cover that, of course. Jamie added, leveraging as many resources as possible is important, including what you're good at. I'm working on figuring out social media as well. Thinking of TikTok. Yeah, if you remember back to our um, lesson on using social media for self-promotion and marketing, you know, if you are thinking about a platform but haven't done it yet, you know, really assess why that platform is going to work for you, you know. Angie is is right. You know, we our particular um, you know, presence on TikTok is pretty weak. It's not that great, but you know, we we can we can definitely make it better if we really sit down and think about its purpose for our unique programs. Something beyond just me doing backflips very poorly. <laughs> but yeah. Because you guys are old. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Abraham. <laughs> Anybody else aside from Evan and Jamie thinking about what seeing the world through the lenses? Yeah, that also helps. Don't forget to think about your audience, right? Who is really your customer base? Because in the end, that's kind of the terminology that people use when talking about their their career as a working artist you know it might be audience you know within the the community world right but within the business world it would be your your client base or your customers who is your audience where are they and what do they need right what services are they looking for that you are able to provide and as artists believe me there's a lot that you can provide to the world I guess that, you know, is a good way to check in to see what things you're, you're all thinking about. Um, you know, remember that a lot of this does come from uh, at least, you know, dedicating a, a month or two to the full planning process. You know, it's not like you have to have all of these answers right away before you get started as a, as a career artist. You know, these are things that you can develop over time and they are things that change over time. Just like a lot of the ways that that you know business has been changing throughout the history of of uh, the industrial revolution. Now, to sort of help to you know bring this home a little bit and to help us really understand that things do change over time, we have this quote from the American filmmaker, TV producer, and publicist Ava DuVernay. You might have heard of her. She's a relatively big deal in the film and arts world. She is quoted as saying, all the traditional models for doing things are collapsing from music to publishing to film. 
And it's a wide open door for people who are creative to do what they need to do without having institutions block their art. Do you agree with this? What are your thoughts about Ava DuVernay's uh, quote here about traditional ways of doing things? What are your thoughts with regard to the institutions? That the other day I was um, watching this short clip on, you know, the guy from uh, Seinfeld, um, the bold chubby guy, I forgot his name, um, Castanza, I guess. Jason, Jason Alexander, the actor. Yeah. So they were asking him, like, uh, what's the difference, right? Like, what's happening before and now, like, uh, in terms of actors? Mm -hmm. He was saying, like, back then, like, even before my career was, like, you want to be an actor, you 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 you, you manage to get somebody to, to get your career going. And he said, nowadays, no, that doesn't exist. That's, that's a different thing. Now you have to pull your resources and make the writers write for you or make things happen on your own. Because mm -hmm. nobody's gonna pick you up. Like, oh, you you look like a good actor. Let me help you be an actor. It's here is you have to create your own opportunities. Mm -hmm. Especially when we were talking about social media and all these things. It's no more of like, let me go to this office and let them beg them for like to help me become the actor or the artist that I want to be. It's mm -hmm. more of a take your own resources or abilities and push it along all all the way, which. Makes it harder because you have to put yourself into many hats, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the state that this remind me of. Yeah, that's that's a good point. You know, the world has changed enough where uh, it's not so much about being in the right place at the right time or even looking for people to give you an opportunity. It's, it's kind of more about now you have to create opportunities for yourself, right? That's kind of what I think I'm getting from the 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 reference you're making there, Abraham. Um, Evan added in the chat, I think with the access to self-publishing and grabbing an audience online, this holds true. Also, work is not as influenced by mainstream sales goals. Yeah, you know, a lot of times as artists, we, you know, don't necessarily go for the, the sales goals model, right? Profitability is not always top of mind and in some instances that's that works really well for us you know in other instances it, it might not but that's the beauty of of being able to create different uh income revenues for yourself right different ways in which you can earn a living um and i think that that is one of the the benefits of the institutions no longer being the gatekeepers that they used to be so um yeah Jamie added in the chat also, it reminds me of how people find careers through becoming famous via social media and the fact that institutions are not 100% necessary for success in the arts nowadays. Yeah, yeah, social media has definitely changed the, the way in which our uh, society kind of interacts with art and uh, yeah, the influencer was not really a job title before, was it? Um, Mojda added, expanding to be your only audience to as many, as many as, yes. Mojda always speaking in, um, <laughs> in poetry. I appreciate that. Yeah, and Evan's right. More people do have access to art now, too. You know, again, that's probably thanks to social media. Also, institutions have been financially inaccessible historically. Yes, I agree with that, Jamie. Plus racism. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you guys, but I personally do feel kind of annoyed by the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a buzzword. Um, you know, in practice, it's a good thing. And in practice, it's very important to give us people of color a place at the table. Uh, I'm sometimes in practice, though, it's not the way that we would interpret equity and inclusion. You know, as people of color, we've been tokenized a lot throughout our lives. Um, historically, personally, you know, I know I have been in situations where I have felt like I've been tokenized and 
that's kind of where the idea of well really where distill arts came to to exist right because i got tired of being the only brown person in the room trying to advocate for other brown people um in the end it just made more sense to go against the pre-established institutions and then start my own in a way that was really truly about the community right and much more uh focused on giving the community what the community asked for as as part of the planning process as part of uh the execution all of that so um yeah dei has sometimes been overused and Jamie added, yeah, the words have little meaning if you don't actually serve the community within the curriculum. Right. You know, um, diversity, equity and inclusion, like I said, is nice on paper, but, you know, not everybody understands what it truly means for those of us that have historically not been included. And I think that's the beauty, again, about us not having to always adhere to the existing institutions you can find our own path and as we have talked about before you know there's obviously a benefit to institutions but a benefit to you know you starting your own career path right on your terms using your particular skills and and strengths to establish a, a way of life that is suitable for you as an individual so last time we talked a little bit about publishing and self-publishing um, specifically, the publisher experience and the publisher as an institution, you know, there are certain benefits that you might gain from working with a publisher. You know, you can get things like editorial guidance and copy editing. Um, obviously, it's important for a publisher, especially a publisher of books, to ensure that things are as accurate as possible. So they'll, ha they'll have usually on hand access to copy editors that will maintain a certain image and level of quality that the publisher expects. You know, they'll try to remove 90, you know, up to 99% of typos and errors. And especially when it comes to things that are fact-based, um, omissions as well, right? They'll, they'll try to remove anything that might damage really the image of the publisher. Publishers also will have, you know, connections within the, within the design world and the shipping and printing world. You know, that's something that, uh, as we discussed before with self-publishing, you would ultimately have to either outsource that to someone, pay someone to do these things, or you do them yourself, which can, you know, help your uh, budget grow uh, if you are looking at, you know, getting grants and that kind of thing, but, you know, is also a much larger expense uh, that, you know, if you go the publishing route, the traditional publishing route, you wouldn't have to necessarily uh, pay for. There's also some marketing support that a publisher might give you, but it usually is limited. If you really think about publishers, how often are they publishing books and how much money can they really genuinely spend on promoting your book if you're being published at the same time as, say, like 20 other authors that are part of that same publishing imprint? So, um, you know, you can get some support there with marketing in terms of basic advertisements and posters, maybe some, you know, uh, priority placement right at the at the doors of a Barnes and Noble where it might be you know more visible um, as opposed to say like in the middle of the stacks with all the other books um, in the end though book tours social media ads and direct sales you know they probably are not going to be paid for by the publisher they're going to be things that you will probably have to arrange yourself as the author and really you know if you're going to be self-publishing, that's kind of what you have to do anyway. Um, so whether you're self-publishing or going the old institutional route, you know, that's something that you would probably need to consider for, for your own career. Self-publishing, of course, does give you much more creative control. As we talked about before, you would be the one to design your book to find a cover artist if you're going to pay someone, you know, to, to design it for you. Uh, you can also maybe not focus so much on the sales goals and focus more on the 
concept of being a designer book or a boutique type of uh you know product you know it could be something that is more handmade and of a higher quality that could also turn into a higher profit margin um, because in the end you know we have to be honest with ourselves we live within a capitalist world that functions off of the exchange of currency so you know profit money all of those things it's just a tool to get you to the place that you want to be in life you know capitalism isn't bad per se it's just the way in which people use the tool of money to advance their own agendas and in your case your agenda is really going to be your art right think about it that way invest in yourself and invest in your work and that's where self-publishing can really help you right because you can potentially have a higher profit and if you're producing over a longer period of time you could potentially have a longer uh opportunity for income residual income to support other projects that you might be working on and then just like i said before you know some Publishers might be able to help you with some marketing, but the reality is they're not going to do much for you by way of marketing. So if you're going to, you know, ultimately pay for your own marketing for your book published by someone else, you could really invest the same amount in publishing for yourself. So uh, things to consider, right, if you're going to go the self-publishing route. And I have touched on this on several occasions during these professional development seminars, but, you know, copyright is very, very important and it's different from trademarks, right? Trademarks protect the use of a company's name, logos, slogans, and products. And it's really about the consumer. It's a way in which like a logo, for example, will not be allowed to be used for a knockoff brand. Um, you know, if it's going to be used in a way to make the consumer think that it's the legitimate brand and then turn around and, I don't know, sell the, the consumer a product that is faulty, you know, that's where the trademark uh, infringement will come in, right? It protects the, the sort of integrity of a brand, whereas copyright protects you, the artist, the author, the person that is the creator of either artistic, literary, musical, dramatic, and certain other intellectual works. Um, this can include things like curriculum. It can include photographs. Uh, it can include uh, certain types of media. Um, basically, the way that it, it works is that when you register it with the U.S. Copyright Office, which is linked here in the handout, it will give you, the artist, exclusive um, you know, rights and ownership over your entire lifetime, plus 70 years. And the copyright can be transferred or sold permanently or temporarily based on a contract. Um, so this is really about protecting your, your ownership of your intellectual property. So that's the difference between copyright and trademark. And really, the only way you can copyright something legitimately is to register it with the U.S. Copyright Office. People have talked about the poor man's copyright, which is where you might mail yourself something and then use that uh, postmark as a way of proving that you created the work. Um, you know, that could kind of work in the sense of, you know, that's when you can prove that it was created. But, um, you know, digital files they within their metadata will show when and who created the so the the digital file um and what software was used and then you know that's another sort of form of proving ownership but there is nothing that will hold up in court as well as an official copyright letter uh from the US copyright office so very important to consider especially when you think about publishing agreements. You know, there's different ways in which uh, you would encounter this type of document, but this is what our publishing agreement looks like. The Distill Arts one um, is a, you know, full-on legitimate, I'll call it, uh, publishing agreement. This is what you will be receiving if you complete your chapbook manuscript and you decide to publish it through Distill Arts. 
Um, this is obviously the you know cover page and it'll show your information. Um, and here at the bottom of the first page, it actually indicates what type of um, formats, file formats you should be submitting your work in. Uh, that is one of the clauses here, and you'll see, right, that it has to be a minimum page count of 25 pages submitted to me, either as a Microsoft Word file or a Google Doc file, um, if you're submitting writing. If you're submitting, say, writing and uh, photographs or illustrations, those photographs or illustrations should be a minimum 300 PPI resolution, and they should be in a JPEG format or a PNG format that's also acceptable if it requires transparencies. Um, and then, of course, if it's a combination like a children's book or a comic book that requires both text and images, then you need to be clear in your manuscript about where the images go, what placement they have within the body of the manuscript. So, you know, again, you did get access to this particular uh, handout, so you can look at this a little bit more closely if you want. But um, as we go through, I'm highlighting some of the very specific areas that, that show you information that is important, such as clause number two. You, through the signing of this particular publishing agreement, are granting the publisher, Distill Arts, exclusive rights to print, publish, and distribute, sell, and license the rights to any and all editions and or formats of the book in whole or in part in the original manuscripts written language throughout the world. In other words, this is uh, really telling you that, you know, you are licensing Distill Arts uh, for Distill Arts is licensing your work for the book, and it can be turned into a variety of formats um, that ultimately could be sold across the world. Um, and it is for a period of three years, as you see here, right? It's for a period of three years from the moment that you sign this, and that this also, um, you know, extends to uh, basically you know, all, all different formats that that uh, we agree to when when creating your work. You also in clause three are indicating that uh, you have the full rights to the book, you know, that you are ultimately the owner and that you are not using uh, this as a platform to defame anybody, to steal anybody else's uh, intellectual property, um, that you're not violating any copyright laws or trademarking, um, you know, registrations. Like the, you're ultimately saying that you are the artist that created this. You're certifying that you are 100% legit the author. And then goes into a little bit more about the, um, you know, design of the book and the cover in clause four, and then upon approval of the cover and everything, it will then be sent to print within a week of the final approval. So when I ask you to review your, your manuscripts, your designs, I am expecting you to look at it as soon as possible and be as thorough as possible. And then again, give me your approval. And before you know it, you will be published. Um, you know, and again, more stuff about like spelling and grammar and how, you know, you are OK with being responsible for handling those things in collaboration with the publisher, with Distill Arts. Your work will be assigned an ISBN number. This is a single ISBN number for just the print version. This does not include the ISBN number for any kind of electronic versions that might exist for sale to the public. Um, Here's our royalty clause. You get 50% royalty on all copies sold uh, with the payment schedule, which is, you know, quarterly and then through direct deposit. And you will also re receive a breakdown of how many copies were sold during the quarter when a, uh, you know, royalty payment is made to you. Also, you get here in this clause 7.1 that uh, you're responsible for paying the taxes, 
All right. So these are all very important things to see built into a contract for publishing specifically, because there's a lot of different you know ways in which a, a person can, you know, sometimes steal money from you. Or, you know, if you don't have, say, a clause that says that, you know, you are able to merchandise your work in other ways, you know, that's that's obviously going to be a detriment to you. You know, let's say your book becomes super popular, but the publisher didn't give you a clause like this one that allows you, the author artist, to sell television rights, film rights, merchandising rights um, without approval of the publisher. You know, that's something that as a courtesy we give to you because, you know, that means that you can turn around and, you know, make like, I don't know, buttons and t-shirts and you can make all sorts of other uh, merchandise using your own creative ideas while the book is available through Distill Arts, you see. Um, if Netflix does approach you, as Abraham is kind of joking in the in the chat, you know, if Netflix approaches you to adapt your chat book into a mini series, you know, we don't want to be an obstacle for you. But there are going to be instances where you'll find publishers that will say, no, you can't do that until five years from now, until our contract stops. And who knows if five years from now, Netflix is going to still have that offer on the table. And a quick one, Luis, uh, in our contract says that we have to be in the cameos for the show. <laughs> we, I can neither agree to that nor disagree to that. <laughs> if you want us in the show, I would not be against it. <laughs> Package deal. Exactly. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more things in here. There's an escape clause. Um, there's a clause in there about, you know, actually checking the, the accounting if you think there's issues related to the accounting. Um, and then arbitration, you know, and what happens if we disagree in the future and, you know, you, you feel like we have to go to court. Um, so, you know, really do look at your contracts in the future because they will... Uh, have those types of options for you um, whenever possible. Go to a lawyer and ask a lawyer to review things like this for you because uh, you do not want to give up your rights as a creative. You know, your intellectual property rights are going to be what ultimately helps you make money. And the way in which you use those rights, those intellectual property rights, uh, you know, will will determine all how like you know successful you are in your own eyes in the future as well that's why it's good to understand these things that that you'll hear from time to time like licensing right licensing controls these three these uh sorry four things the how the when the where and for how long other people can use your artwork uh, you are the owner of the copyright, especially if you, you know, are registering it through the copyright office, right? And publishers can only copyright the work that they create. So, for example, you, as you develop your manuscript through our program, you are creating something that you can copyright and call your own. When you license the manuscript to Distill Arts through that publishing agreement, you are saying that we have the permission to, for three years, offer as a product a book that, as a designer, we can copyright. Distill Arts can hold the copyright of the book, the object, the designed object. But that's it. We're licensing the material that's inside from you. So... You know, it can be a little confusing, but always remember that in the end, you are licensing the work to us, the publisher, and that is how it should always be. You should always license the work to whoever it is that is going to publish your work in the future. If it's Netflix, you're not selling the rights for your story to Netflix. You should license your rights to Netflix. That way you continue to hold the copyright um, and then you can do it again, you know, you can have like, say, another uh, entity like Paramount, 
you know, they can then license the work 10 years from now or 25 years from now, or HBO can license the work 50 years from now, and they can reboot the series uh, as, as they see fit, right? Um, and that becomes, again, another recurring source of income for you by licensing it. Work for hire contracts are different. If you're entering into a work for hire contract, that's going to be usually a short term kind of thing. Um, it's for commercial work, and you usually will be giving up your intellectual property rights through a work for hire contract. That means that somebody is paying you or commissioning you to create a unique piece of artwork that they then will own. And hopefully, if they're a good person, they'll you know give you permission to add it to your portfolio, right? That's always a good thing to ask for. Um, that way you can continue to get work and other commissions in the future. Uh, but that's the difference between, you know, licensing something to someone else and then being hired through a work for hire contract. You can also actually engage in work for hire contracts as the employer as well. Yes, Abraham. Yeah, I have many of my teachers who were working for uh, Locust Studios or Disney. Mm -hmm. And they were showing us some of their work, but some of them, they say like, we cannot show you because part of our contract doesn't yep. allow us to use it for portfolio until it comes out. Yep. How many of you have ever wondered why, uh, like, for example, the Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, specifically has Tim Burton's name on the, on everything, right? It's Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. It's because he's the one that owns the story. He just licensed it to Disney so that they could, you know, turn it into a movie. Um, so, you know, like there's little things like that, that, that you can uh, just, again, really think about before you engage in any kind of deal with someone. And, you know, again, I'm no lawyer, but I can definitely tell you that, you know, a lawyer will will be able to really accurately look at any kind of publishing agreement or licensing agreement and say, you know, this is going to either benefit you or hurt you. And I know enough at least to know that if you are actively submitting your work to the copyright office to be copywritten, to be registered, then you are for certain protecting yourself from other people stealing your work, you know, and then you can go the legal route of asking for people to pay you a royalty for using your work if they use it without your permission or at the bare minimum you know they can stop using it and claiming it as theirs also there's other things you may be aware of things like the creative commons or open source um, sometimes those get thrown around as ways of talking about licensing and you know ways in which you can um, share work with others there they have very specific use cases Creative Commons itself is a nonprofit organization that helps people um, register works so that they're still given credit as the owner, but, you know, will allow you the flexibility or the consumer will say the flexibility of reusing and remixing your work in a way that still allows for some sort of, you know, again, credit to you as the original author, but, you know, kind of like a, another way of of people maybe turning artwork that exists into their own version of that artwork. Uh, if you want to learn more about Creative Commons, I definitely recommend you go to the website so you can be properly informed about that and how that can or can you know potentially protect you or hurt you uh, in, in certain situations. And then open source is very specifically related to software and source code. Um, some people sometimes will call the work of art as kind of like an open source sort of thing, but um, but it really isn't. It's only specific to software and source codes and how those codes can then be uh, really incorporated into a whole new platform for something that somebody already created. So again, to learn more, visit the website here that's linked in the handout. Um, here's some potential ways in which you can license your work. Um, again, you know, always license it, don't sell it. Never sell your rights for 
anything because you're ultimately giving up your your creative control. But a good way in which you could license your work would be for, you know, film, TV, stage or sound media, um, you know, movies, TV shows, plays, music, audiobooks, digital media could be anything from video games and videograms, videos to like virtual reality and augmented reality environments um, or just elements for those things. Memes, that's also something where you could potentially license your work so that it becomes a meme. Um, you know, I've yet to see that really happen in a way that actually monetizes it for people, but you know, I'm sure there's a way you can make that happen. Print media is almost always going to be a license kind of thing. Um, you know, it could be adapting your chapbook of poetry into a comic, uh, or a pamphlet or broadside. Um, it could be photo prints, you know, there's the master photo, which is usually going to be either a digital negative or a physical negative. Um, so you could license that into a photo print. Uh, you know, that's a way to, to kind of understand that or maybe adapting it into a coloring book, right? Uh, pay a subscription to use a meme. That's not a bad idea, Jamie. Just saying. Um, and then, yeah, like Abraham said, his, uh, his toy, his action figure, um, he can always license his, his likeness to become a doll. <laughs> um or a stuffed animal right you could always do do a stuffed animal um but you know there's a lot of different ways in which you can license your intellectual property especially if you're a, a visual artist i feel you know you can always print something onto a t-shirt tote bag uh, but you could then maybe 3d model it and turn it into a toy i think that that's kind of cool um or you could turn it into like a like a mug or a bowl or, you know, a whole host of other things that people will find useful. <clears throat> but again, that would be licensing, not selling your rights. Now, if you do need to create a work for hire contract, because let's say you are, you know, creating your manuscript, but you don't want to be the one to actually design it. Right? You don't want to be the one to design the book. Well, most work for hire contracts are going to have these three things here, right? That'll have the payment terms. And I, I like I like to say, you know, whenever whenever you can pay artists what they're worth. We did talk about, you know, bartering. And if that is something that, a, that an artist is open to doing for you, then yeah, of course you can barter. Of course you can take advantage of your relationships with uh, other artists. But as much as possible, really value the people that you work with and pay them um, because <laughs> whether we like it or not, like I said, it's what the, what makes the world go around. So um, through that process though, of course, designate how and when you re you will give them the payments, right? Whether it's one lump sum at the end, or if you're going to do a split payment, and that's always really useful. <laughs> right. They all have to eat some more than others and some less than others like me i should really be eating less than others <laughs> any questions so far i feel like i'm going through this pretty fast i think another thing to remind yourselves is like um let's say you hire a painter or a illustrator to create a book and if you want to create the edition of two or three or whatever you may have to rewrite uh, your contract and payment, maybe pay again for it. I don't know. Yeah, that is true. You know, a first edition can be different from a second edition, different enough where some of these payment terms and use terms do need to be revisited and you will need to, to pay people again um, or modify the contracts so that it, it covers those secondary uses, right? Um, the use terms are going to really cover the when and the how. So work for hire, you know, again, it's it's usually a commissioned work. And if you restrict how the commissioned artist is able to use the original work, you know, that could be to your benefit, right? It creates less competition. Um, but it's also, I think, a professional courtesy to allow people to use the work for their own promotional purposes, right? You want to give people a chance to get more work 
more commissions based off of their previous commissions. Um, Jamie asks in the chat, how does licensing work for people who co-write something? Um, is payment between the writers also just split down the middle? I think that, that that type of circumstance, if you're working with like a collaborator, that's something that you should always have in writing, um, especially when you are talking about like, a, I don't know, like a play, for example, if you're going to produce a play, you know, you could bill both the writers, right? They They could be both on the playbill as the writers, but... Um, payment wise, you know, that's, uh, again, going to kind of depend on how you structured your agreement with them. 50 50 is great if they did do 50% of the writing. Um, but again, you know, if they came in as an editor after the fact, you know, maybe you would give them like a 25% sort of equivalent. Um, so it, it could get a little dicey, right? Um, it's really going to depend on the level of collaboration and how you are structuring your own agreement with them from the get-go as to what their roles are in the collaborative process. Sometimes names are also wages, uh, like indicators of, of wage. Yeah. Because for example, if you have a famous writer, if somebody's helping you just because the book is going to be sold more because of the famous writer, right? Mm -hmm. And for example, there's a lot of artists do their biography, right? Mm -hmm. but basically hire a writer to create their bio and the writers don't get most of the money. It's probably the, the celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, or like the case of a ghost writer, uh, you know, I can almost guarantee you that like Donald Trump did not write his books. Uh, he could barely write tweets. So, you know, he more than likely had a ghostwriter writing his book using his voice. Um, and he probably paid the ghostwriter. And the ghostwriter more than likely could not actually come out publicly to say that they were the ghostwriter for at least 10 years or something like that. So there's um, definitely like ways in which you could give a person credit. Um, but if it's a work for hire sort of situation, then you know you you really need to to put those things down in writing, um, and either pay up front for the service that they provide, or create some sort of arrangement that says you'll get I don't know like ten percent of the royalties, and I get forty percent of the royalties, or you know something like that. Um, so so again, really work with someone be i would say equitable you know in the way in which you pay them pay them a rate that is uh consistent with what you know you you feel other other artists are receiving for this for a similar service so yeah it's all in the contract terms exactly jamie um and again you know be as specific as possible so when you do create a work for hire contract add things like design specifications and how you expect things to be delivered to you remember the publishing agreement that we that we just reviewed clause number 1 specifically outlines the minimum number of pages the formats that you are expected to submit your work in which is either microsoft word or a google doc um not napkins, Abraham, <laughs> not in this case. Um, but, you know, if it's a scan, uh, scanned illustration that was done on a napkin, as long as it's in 300 PPI, then I'm good. Um, so, you know, like those are things to, to definitely uh, make clear from the beginning, along with the use terms and also the payment terms. As well as the schedule of things. Yeah. Especially if you're paying somebody, it's like, okay, we have till these deadlines mm -hmm. and that will help you if the person became a lazy person or something right. happens, right? You might right. already cover yourself like in terms of time because you, you don't want to work to be turning two years later. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So um, to help you in the event that you might need to use a work for hire contract, I have provided for you as part of the packet here a sample work for hire contract. Um, this was taken from 
a legitimate legal services website uh, that also offered this as a contract. And, you know, I made my own modifications uh, to better reflect us as artists. So um, you'll see here, you know, it looks like a letter ultimately with your name information at the top and then the contracted artist name information there. Uh, and then everywhere where it says insert your name here or insert the artist name and all of that information can be modified as as necessary but remember you know these are the big things that that we were just talking about um you know they are at least with this version they're ultimately certifying that they're not using software that could be generally called ai right artificial intelligence to create the work they are the original artist that is you know not creating work that is uh infringing upon the copyright of any other person. Um, you're also right here outlining that the, the work will be delivered on X date, right? So you're giving them a deadline. That's very important, as Abraham said. And it should be following whatever specifications uh, you outline. So, you know, add that right here according to the following specifications. And then you can obviously reference the, the specs that I will be referencing. Um, when I ask for your manuscripts in the future, um, that could potentially help. Of course, that depends on on your particular needs, but you know we are obviously focusing on the types of things that we do through Distill Arts. Um, and then you know here's again right the cost, the the commission rate, and so this is how much money you expect to pay them, um, the payment schedule. So you might want to do like. 25% up front and then 75% at the very end, um, you know, or 50 50, however, if you feel comfortable. And then right here, uh, this is work for hire, for hire agreement and the effective purchase of the complete rights assigned to the work. So that means that you are buying the work and all of the rights associated. And again, the artist will only have the right to use samples of the commissioned artwork as part of their promotional or marketing activities for their services, with no commercial gains to be made beyond those through the use of said promotional work. So you want to allow people to make money off of their work if you're hiring them, if you're commissioning them, just you know, not directly competing with you uh, for the work that they created. You know, in other words, they can't take the work that they created for you and turn around and you know use your logos to turn it into a poster right that is like a we'll call it like a knockoff poster of your particular intellectual property yeah feel free to reference this if you yourself find the need to create a work for hire contract now did bring up lawyers a couple of times in the end, it's going to depend on whether or not you find yourself in a position where large amounts of money are going to be exchanged, right? That's when you should really consider getting yourself a lawyer and legal representation to review your, um, you know, contracts and to review any kind of agreements that you're, you're entering into, licensing or otherwise. Um, but sometimes there's other types of people that you might need. And those other types of people could be things like agents or, you know, even union representation. They offer different things, but they can both provide things like professional connections and opportunities. Um, like I write right here, you know, talent representation usually means an agent sells your skills, talent or art on your behalf. Um, so if you do decide to go with an agent, that's sort of their purpose. Um, they are on your behalf advocating for people to hire you, whereas a union is going to represent you when you have been hired. You know, they're going to give you opportunities to network with other people and other employment opportunities that, that will ensure equitable pay. Um, but that's something that usually takes care of you after you have been hired, after you have actually gotten a job or a gig um, in any kind of environment where you know, that that applies. They can also uh, help you to kind of review contracts and help you negotiate contracts. 
you know, agents, they are intermediaries. And as their client, as your client, sorry, as their client, you are going to want someone to advocate for you in a way that, you know, gets you to earn a little bit more because in the end, the agent's incentive is to get you the best deal possible so that their 10 to 15% commission is bigger. That's how they get paid. They get paid when you get paid. That's also a red flag to consider. If they are asking you to pay them first and then they might get you a gig, that's probably not a legitimate or even uh, an agent with strong ethical practices. So, um, you know, don't don't feel like you you have to pay for representation. Um, that only applies for unions. You know, you pay a union fee and then you get the representation because of that. Um, but in the case of an agent, you know, they are their incentive is to get you the best deal so that their commission, that 10 to 15 percent commission is bigger. Um, both of them might give you some, you know, some advice, but it's usually not going to be legal. Uh, you know, explicitly legal advice. Agents are not attorneys. Um, only a certified attorney can give you any kind of real legal advice. The nice thing about ben uh, about a union, though, is that if you are paying your union fees, some unions will have actual attorneys on their uh, on retainer who can help you and give you legitimate legal advice. And then, of course, there's also, you know, connections with specialists. Agents might work with certain kinds of specialists to help you with branding, to help you maintain your public image or even act as editors. But they'll usually refer you to other specialists that do that as part of their job. Um, and the same generally goes with unions, uh, especially unions for for working artists. You know, they they have usually deals with other agencies that can connect you with, uh, you know, marketing specialists and branding and um, even people that can help you maintain a, a public image. If you're going to look for a, an agent, if that is the path that you want to consider, definitely do your research. Don't just, you know, go for the first person. Think about what other properties they've sold and to who, you know, that might mean that they, you know, might understand your work better if they've sold other properties um, that are similar to yours to, you know, other uh, publishers or, you know, um, media companies, that kind of thing, um, which goes back to, you know, who else are they representing? If it's a person that really does not understand what it's like to be uh, Latino, you know, because they have no other Latino artists under their uh, representation pool, then, you know, they might not really know how to market you. They might not really understand your background and, um, you know, what you bring to the table. So uh, it does it does help to look at who else they represent. Also, um, think about the type of contractual obligations that you might enter into when you sign an agreement with them on for, for representation. Uh, you don't want to be scammed, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> That's that's I guess a good good question to ask when you're interviewing an agent. You know, what's the best taco place um, to represent me? <laughs> uh, that's a good one, Abraham. Um, but yeah, you know, beware if they are requiring you to have exclusivity contracts where you only get to work with them. Um, you know, not all agents are specialists in things like video games. You know, they're not all specialists in audio uh, formats. And, you know, if it's an, a literary agent, they should probably not, you know, keep you from expanding into those other media fields. Um, but if their contract says that they can only work with you, uh, you know, that may be good. That may not be so good. You know, that's, that's kind of up to, up to you for, for you to decide. If you want to learn more about the function of an agent, specifically a literary agent, I definitely recommend you visit this website. Uh, from Poets and Writers. Poets and Writers is a very uh, esteemed and legitimate magazine that has existed for decades. Um, this is off of their blog, and it, it does explain a little bit more of the function of a literary agent 
And they also have a listing of different literary agents and what type of work those literary agents usually will uh, represent. It's also worth noting, though, that um, poetry books themselves are not considered very high, uh, you know, high earning. And so most agents will not represent poets. But if you are a poet and you also write, um, you know, short stories or long form prose like novels, you know, the screenplays, those those will obviously get you somebody, you know, uh, get somebody to look at you. Right. Um, because those will potentially earn more money for them in the long, long run. But yeah, unfortunately, people like me as a poet will have a very hard time finding a literary agent. Any questions so far? Well, we'll continue on. And of course, you know, to just talk, touch on unions a little bit more, you know, unions are about leveraging collective strength. Um, I mean, we don't need to go into the whole history of it, but, you know, some things to think about when looking at potential unions to join as artists, specifically as writers, you know, there's different benefits to them, things that might include a minimum salary requirement, um, you know, protection of your intellectual property and residuals if you are writing for TV or for film. Um, that also could include things like health insurance and discounts on different forms of of insurance, such as uh, general liability insurance for your business or uh, discount on your homeowner's insurance. You know, it could even include things like pensions, right? They have different types of benefits that they offer to their members who are paying their union dues. Um, some of them do have eligibility requirements. Uh, some of them require a minimum number of publishing credits before you can become a member. And some of them don't. Um, and of course, there's always the cost, right? Union dues and membership have different structures, you know, different fee structures. Some of them don't charge you for, I don't know, a couple of months until you are finally able to pay. Um, you just really want to make sure that you do your research and really understand the benefits that you're getting if you do join a union and whether or not they're benefits that will help you in your career. Um, but generally speaking, unions are great. I'm definitely pro-union. And if you can afford it, go for one. Um, because there's at least a couple that in our little limited research that we did um, and in researching this particular slide show, um, you know, we can we can say these are these are pretty good. Uh, there's the National Writers Union, and we do have the website up here. Uh, they cover writers working in pretty much all media, um, including freelance and uh, employed professionals, which is nice. Um, and then there's different ways in which they classify uh, employed professionals, you know, so you may not have to necessarily be a screenwriter, but you could be a playwright. Uh, you can be a poet, which is always nice. Um, you could be a person that's write, writing for just web content. Um, if you're a translator, you would definitely be eligible. Um, they offer things like medical, dental, vision insurance options and assistance if you can't afford it. Uh, if you are a journalist, obviously you can benefit from a press pass. Uh, there's also legal and career advice that they can give you, plus this one contract grievance assistance. So, you know, if you enter into a contract, a licensing agreement with someone or a work for hire contract and they don't pay you, this particular union will make sure that you have the legal support you need in order to, you know, file uh, any kind of lawsuit that you may need to. Um, they do have monthly dues, but their dues are on a sliding scale structure. Um, so you could pay as low as twelve fifty a month. Um, basically, just a really, really customized Starbucks coffee, and you could probably afford it a month. <laughs> Easy with that, Abraham. Ain't no no leg breaking going on here. <laughs> um, there's also the Authors Guild, which is uh, open to traditionally published authors and illustrators with at least one published book and also self-published authors who, as you can see here, 
earned less than $5,000 in the past 18 months and freelance writers who have published three or more pieces or made less $5,000 or less in the past 18 months. So this one, the eligibility is also a little bit more open, um, very similar benefits as the last one. And they have also the regular membership at $135 a year or $12 a month. So it's a little bit cheaper. And these also have, um, this union also has one specifically for emerging writers. So um, you don't get the full benefits of the full, you know, eligibility pool, but um, this is for unpublished writers only. And it's $100 a year or $9 a month as of this recording, um, or at least when we did the research. Those, those union dues may or may not have changed. Uh, in the past year, but you know we at least have a couple of there, a uh, couple of unions there for you to look into. Now there is a difference between a, a union and a membership organization or a trade organization. Um, these are also valuable. Uh, they're also really good for expanding your network, um, but these are not going to be the same thing as a union. These are really about your professional development and making, you know, your network larger. So an example is something like the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the people that put on the Oscars. They are a membership organization. They are not a union. Um, and of course, if you're a member, you do get some benefits in terms of like, you know, pathways for emerging filmmakers, actors, writers, and more. Um, and then membership in this organization also means that you could be nominated for an award through the, the uh, Oscars, right? So, um, so there's a benefit to it there. Uh, but then there's also things like the Academy of American Poets, which again, this is more about expanding your network, um, not so much about, you know, really, <laughs> I guess, getting any jobs through this, although you could potentially um get some publishing opportunities that might not come to you otherwise uh you know it just builds your your uh you know visibility in in the the poetry world at the national level um and then your dues also pay for programs such as like the poem a day newsletter or all of the different activities that happen around the month of april national poetry month locally <clears throat> Locally, you have the Arts for LA. And Arts for LA is uh, more of an advocacy organization. They are going to kind of really work more in, I would say, the arts education sphere. They tend to advocate more in, in that area. Um, but they do also have initiatives that, you know, help people with like mentorship and uh, you know, getting larger amounts of funding for grants that support arts programs in the community. So, you know, they're, they're more structured in that way. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's really about your professional development if you're going to go for a membership or a trade organization um, membership uh, either way. And then, um, again, it's always worth to remember that whether you join a union or, you know, you have an agent, it really comes down to having a network of like-minded artists with whom you can share ideas, resources, and more. You know, the more that we, as an organization, do these types of workshops and the more that we, that we work with you, the more we see the true value of working in community with community. Um, because in the end, you know, we really do have to rely on, you know, the, the sort of bonds that we create with one another. The social bonds really have a, I think, very valuable place in, in our society um, and more so for us as artists because, you know, we have to start somewhere. And a lot of times we do start with that mentality of the starving artist, but you know, it's not about living in that mentality all the time. It's about being in, you know, in a mindset, in a place where 
you understand your value and no one is going to understand your value like other people who are working in the same field as you. So again, whether you are joining a union, self-publishing, you know, whatever this, whatever path your career takes, just always remember to, to have a network, have your own little arts fam like we have here. And, you know, remember that we're always here to support you uh, as, as you develop as an artist. So with that, I'll leave you with our little bit of homework here, which is really to look at the, at the slide deck, you know, really look at the things that we covered today, especially those sample contracts and agreements, because those are going to be things that will help you approach future agreements, future licensing agreements and contracts. Um, if you can understand them now, you're going to be better prepared in the future when you start to actually get these, these things presented to you from people outside of our little community here. And with that, if anyone that is watching on the live streams or later on YouTube, you know, you can always visit our website. You can always follow us on social media for other workshops and additional updates that we might have. Um, and, you know, we are, again, here for you, too. You know, just because you're not enrolled in the program at this time doesn't mean that you can't still benefit from some of these resources. And for that, we do make our say, ourselves available. Uh, you can always email us directly or visit our website, um, shoot us a, a message, and we're more than happy to answer questions that you might have. Thanks again, everyone, for joining in. I hope you all have a great night. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all next time. Take care, everybody.